How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends. My name is John Lomakang, and we'd like to welcome you again to another wonderful evening, a comfortable one now, in the city of New York, where we are all gathered together, waiting for this topic entitled, Proving the Prophets. You know, people are going crazy nowadays with all these predictions about what's going to happen when the year 2000 comes. Stick with us tonight, and you'll find out what God's Word says about the true and the false prophets and all those claiming to have that gift. Also, Friday evening, the topic is a jar of oil. What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit being poured out in the last days, and how can we know the counterfeits? That's Friday evening, and Sabbath morning, you cannot afford to miss the topic coming up, the unsinkable ship. Pastor Doug has done some study and research about the Titanic that you want to hear about, so make that appointment on your calendar, 11 o'clock on Saturday morning, that Sabbath. Join us for that exciting topic, and we will look forward to seeing you. Now, tonight, before we go any further into our topic, we'd like to invite you to join with us here in Manhattan, those all around the world. Let's bow our heads together and invite God's presence to be with us tonight. Let's bow. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so filled with joy tonight as we see the way that your hand continues to guide. We thank you for that fence that you've built around us to keep us safe as we have walked the streets of this city. And we thank you for those whom you've kept safe as they have joined us from around the world, from North America, uh, Europe, Canada, South America, Asia, New Guinea, Australia, all the world that is now gathering together as this wonderful net of the gospel is being cast. We pray that the seeds that are being sown may spring up to life eternal, so send your spirit not only here tonight, but may this world be enveloped by his power and his presence. We also pray for Pastor Doug Batchelor tonight as you would open his heart and mind and fill us with the excitement of studying the word. And Lord, may we be blessed and drawn closer to thee because of this time we spend with you tonight. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, join me as we welcome our speaker this evening, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good evening. Welcome to uh, Millennium of Prophecy from Manhattan, New York, New York. And uh, this has been a really exciting time for us. I'm almost sad that it's coming to an end. Almost sad. I want to go home. <laughs> but I have enjoyed this very much. And I'll invite Mrs. Bachelor out. We will see how many questions we can do in about five minutes. How long? Five minutes to greet the world and do questions. <laughs> All right. I got well, long-winded, sorry. You did. All right. Well, we want to say a special thank you to the pastor and elders of the Kanjedza Church in Malawi, Africa. We're very grateful that they have allowed their lay pastor, Peter Minpin Ganjira, to come and be a translator in the Chechua language for the people in Central Africa. So we're thankful for that. In fact, we're going to thank a couple more translators, Gus and Ira Tercios. Ter that's it, yes. Yes, that's one. We want to thank the New Jersey Conference for letting them come. And, and they also are members at the Spanish Manhattan Church. And we appreciate that. Also, Eric Ang and Jackson Lee are alternating, alternating the Mandarin translation. And they're also from the local New York Chinese Amen. Seventh-day Adventist this Church. This happened at the last minute. You know how many people in the world speak that language? A lot. These tapes and these programs are going to reach millions. All right. Just to sidelight, we have 30,000 viewers attending the nightly broadcast in Mozambique. 
Amen. Africa. So Amen. we're excited about that. Also, we want to thank the um, North American Division for allowing Pastor Gerard Latchman to come and translate for us. He's directing the student missionary program. I'm having a hard time getting said the things I need to get said. But let's, that's okay. I'm having do some fun. Questions. I got to find them. You know what? I left my questions in the bag. All right. I remember some of them. Okay. Sorry. Someone was asking about baptism for the dead. Go ahead and ask me. <laughs> so, 1 Corinthians 15. Go ahead. So, so please explain 1 Corinthians 15 okay. where Paul talks about baptizing for the dead. This is a scripture that's been used. You know, some churches baptize people in behalf of loved ones that have already died. Are you aware that the Bible does not condone that? It's appointed unto man once to die after that, the judgment. You will be rewarded based on each man's works, the Bible says. Ezekiel tells us that though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, they will deliver neither son nor daughter, but they will be delivered by their own righteousness. You cannot superimpose your righteousness on somebody else. Oh, here's some questions. Only Jesus can cover us with his righteousness. Amen? Amen. Now, what does Paul mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Turn very quickly there, and you can go to verse um, 29. Else what shall they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead not, are not raised at all? Remember what I said opening night. Do not build a doctrine on one verse. This is the only verse that even gives this kind of a hint. This is interpreted one of two ways. First of all, Paul could be ridiculing the Corinthians who had a lot of problems. Read 1 Corinthians. They were doing a lot of things wrong. They had adultery in the church. They were misusing the gift of tongues. They may have been baptizing for the dead. And he said, here, I hear you baptizing for the dead. And then you say you don't believe in the resurrection. You're being hypocrites. He wasn't agreeing that they were doing the right thing. He was using their practice to say, and you hear you don't believe in a resurrection. Then what good is baptizing for the dead? Or he could be using the word dead spiritually. Turn a few verses later. Verse 31. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die daily. Now, what does he mean by death there? Paul many times says, he that is dead, Romans 6, is free from sin. We are baptized for being dead in sin. If we don't believe there's a resurrection, what good is baptism for being dead, is what Paul is saying. In sin. He's not talking about baptized for other dead people. So that's the answer for that. All right. Do we have time for one more? Yes, we do. Okay. What about wedding rings? Last night you talked about jewelry. How, where do wedding rings fit into that scheme? Do you want a Bible answer? Okay. Wedding rings aren't in the Bible. <laughs> Mrs. Bachelor and I are married. A ring doesn't make you married. Wedding rings came from paganism. Now, you want a Bible answer, okay? Uh, and I want to reiterate there are a lot of lovely, godly people that are going to be in heaven that wear wedding rings. But there's nothing in the Bible that tells us about this. Uh, and I've seen some beautiful services where they say, oh, this ring of gold that's unending and... It, it dates back to the Egyptians. It was a sign of property. When someone, uh, when a slave lost her virginity, there was some connotations connected with putting a ring on the finger. And uh, it found its way into the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, the Roman culture. And from the Romans, it made its way into the church during the Dark Ages. It's not in the Bible. And you just wanted to know what the Bible said. If you show me a scripture that says, thou shalt wear a wedding ring, I'll be happy to share it with everybody. Well, Pastor John went out on the streets today to find out what New Yorkers think about prophecy. Would you like to find out? Take a look. The future. So many want to know it. So many claim to know it. Is there a way that we can know the future and be ready for it? With so many tabloid predictions, psychics, and Bible prophets, who can we trust? Well, here we are today on the streets of Manhattan trying to find out from people what they believe about prophecies and the future. So stick with us. You'll be surprised by some answers you get. Is there a way that we can know the future and be ready for it? Only if we have faith. We have to have faith in the uh, powers to be. He has many names, or she. And uh, yes, we can have intuition and we have to listen to it. What do you believe about prophets and psychics predicting the future? Well, I believe that there's some people that are very good about it. I believe that probably everybody has that ability. It's just that some people know how to use it and some people don't. Well, I think psychics are phonies. And um, as far as um, prophets, I think they're more believable. And a lot of the things that um, they discuss happening in the future, a lot of it is coming true. So hmm, that's my opinion. <laughs> 
things like Notre Dame's prophecies seem to have come true and, you know, the specifics he spoke in about Hitler and other um, tragic happenings like earthquakes and stuff like that seems to have some validity to it. And also um, police detectives as you have used um, psychics in their work and some of them seem to have helped. Which one do you think is more reliable, a psychic or a prophet? The prophet, to me, is more liable to believe in prophecy. And why? Uh, because since we were born, uh, you know, uh, uh, the religion say that the prophecy is more accurate than psychic. Because the psychic sometimes they force. Okay. okay, they just want to make money. What do you believe about psychics and prophets and their ability to tell the future? I think that's a great gift, but I really don't think anybody can really foretell the future. I think that's up to God to see how things are going to be. So I don't. I mean, the people think that, you know, that that's what they think, but... Um, I think it's a lot of garbage. So you don't, you don't believe in that stuff at all? Definitely not, no. I don't really believe psychics or uh, prophets, those people, you know, because I don't... I believe something. If you believe something strong, you can't make it happen that way, you know. That's what I'm thinking. I think psychics are evil, and I don't believe in them at all. They are fake. They are totally fake. And they make up what they... Um, anything they say is made up, and it's... They're just um, creations by the devil, and I do not believe in them at all. I believe in God and that God has a plan for you, and you should never uh, live your life by psychics. You should live it by the Bible. Well, I was encouraged to hear someone in New York City air that opinion. Would you like to see an amazing fact? Now, on your right, you'll notice our handbill that we designed about a year ago for the Millennium of Prophecy Seminar. Uh, we made millions of these that have gone around the country and around the world. On your left, you'll see the World Weekly News magazine for November 16. Now, what's the date today? Today is November 10. This is November 16. We're giving you the news before it happens. November 16, 1999. Is it just me, or do you see a similarity between our handbill and the World Weekly News head front page. Look at that. They've got the hourglass is swapped from one hand to the other. On the inside of our handbill, it says Armageddon, angels, mark of the beast, the uh, rapture, and uh, antichrist. And here on their magazine, it says Armageddon, the rapture, the mark of the beast, angels. I guess we've hit the big time now. We inspired World Weekly News with our headline. Our our uh, handbill and our advertising. Incidentally, we did not borrow ours. We created it. But you know why they took that? Because they know that people are extremely interested in prophecy, and I'll guarantee they're going to sell bushels of those magazines. People want to know what the future holds. There's a lot of people claiming to be prophets, how can we know the difference between the true and the false prophets? Are there any true prophets left? Maybe that gift is gone from the church. What do you think? Let's find out what the Bible says. We'll go to our lesson for tonight. Amen? The lesson is proving the prophets, using the Bible standard. How, have you done your lesson? You filling them out? How many of you will confess you fill them out when you get here? Oh, you got an honest group here in New York City, but I'm glad you're doing it. You'll remember it better. Our historical comes to us from the life of King Jehoshaphat in the times of Ahab. King Jehoshaphat was a good king. You've heard the expression, jumping Jehoshaphat. Well, that's not in the Bible. But he was a good king, and he was the first king who decided to develop an alliance with the wicked king Ahab, who lived in the northern kingdom. Ahab is the one who married Jezebel. He was not a good king. Jehoshaphat worshipped the Lord Jehovah. Ahab worshipped Baal. Well, they got together for a dinner one day, and after their feast, Ahab tried to get Jehoshaphat to join him in attacking their common enemy, the Syrians, that they might recapture the land, the city of Ramoth-Gilead. And Jehoshaphat wanted to be cooperative because they were trying to forge a peace between their two kingdoms. He said, my chariots are like your chariots, my horses like your horses, but uh, before I sign on the dotted line, let's inquire of the Lord. Well, when Jehoshaphat said, inquire of the Lord, Ahab was thinking of God in the general sense. He said, no problem. He clapped his hands, and out came 400 prophets of Baal. And he said, should we go to Ramoth-Gilead or not? 
And they all said, go up and prosper. The Lord's going to bless you. You're going to be victorious. And they began to be very dramatic with all their antics and told them, you're going to win the battle. And uh, Jehoshaphat noticed that there were no prophets of Jehovah there. These were all prophets of Baal. And he said, uh, is there a prophet of Jehovah we could ask for my benefit? He said, oh, there's one left, but I don't like him. He's negative. He doesn't ever say anything positive. He said, well, let's give him a chance. So Ahab sent a messenger to go get the last prophet of God that they could find, Micaiah. And the messenger, as he was bringing Micaiah before this assembly, they're all celebrating and they had the hors d'oeuvres going around and they're saying, having a pep rally, going to go fight, we're going to win, win, win. And he said, look, they're having a good time. The messenger told Micaiah, don't mess up the party. Say something positive this time. So when Micaiah got there, Ahab said, well, what do you say? Should we go to Ramoth Gilead and fight or not? And Micaiah said, go and prosper. Ahab knew he was being sarcastic. He said, come on now, tell me what the Lord says. He said, okay, I'll tell you what the Lord says. The Lord had a gathering. He said, who's going to deceive Ahab so that he might go die at Ramoth Gilead? And finally, a lying spirit said, I will go and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. He said, I saw Israel scattered on the hills as sheep having no shepherd, meaning the king would die. And Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat and said, I told you he'd be negative. I told you he'd say bad things about me. Well, Jehoshaphat made a mistake. He listened to the 400 prophets of Baal instead of the one prophet of God, and he joined Ahab and they went into battle. Now, Ahab knew the prophets of God were dependable. He knew about Elijah, who was a prophet of God who never failed. And so he thought, you know, he says I'm going to die in battle. I'm going to take every precaution to see that God doesn't kill me. I'm going to outsmart the Lord. I'm going to stay on the outskirts of the battle. I'm not going to dress up like the king. I'm going to put on armor from head to toe. I'm going to be in my chariot with my bodyguard, and I'll be safe. Now, he didn't tell Jehoshaphat what he was thinking. He said to Jehoshaphat, uh, you go into the battle. Oh, I, yeah, Micaiah told him. I forgot to read the scripture to you. And Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he had him put in prison for being honest. So Ahab, he's in his chariot. And he goes into battle. He tells Jehoshaphat, you put on your robes and dress up like a king and I'll hang out like a common soldier. I'll fight. Well, the king of Syria said, don't fight with young or old, but fight with the king of Israel. And the only one they saw dressed up like a king was Jehoshaphat. So all of his captains started charging after Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was regretting that he went into battle with Ahab and he cried out and said, Lord, forgive me, save me. And God delivered him. He sent angels and saved him or did something to intervene. In the meantime, Ahab is smugly on the outskirts of the battle, and the Bible says a certain man drew a bow at a venture. That means we don't even know if it was one of the people of Israel or the Syrians. But an arrow went zinging through the air, ricocheted off another arrow or something, got picked up by a bird and then dropped. We don't know how it happened. But a stray arrow went flying through the air, and it found a little bitty crack in the breastplate of Ahab's armor and it cut a major artery and rather than running and getting medical help that proud king propped himself up he refused to acknowledge defeat in the chariot until he bled to death and he died and the prophecy came true the majority of the prophets were wrong the majority of the prophets on Mount Carmel 850 to 1 were wrong and you'll find that there are often many more false prophets than true ones. How do we know the difference? Let's find out what the Bible says. There are some clues in God's Word so we can know. Amen? Amen. Question number one. To whom does the Lord reveal His final plans? And say the answers with me. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. God has prophets and He reveals the future to them. As I showed you during our amazing fact, people in the world today are fascinated with the subject of prophecy, especially as we're crossing this threshold of the year 2000. There's a lot of interest. This is Newsweek for this month. What the Bible says about the end of the world. Now, these magazines are not just trying to educate people. They know what sells. They know that people have a heightened interest. Interest in prophecy has reached an unprecedented apex because there's so much focus on the end of the world. There's a school. 
that's called me a couple of times, and they're wanting to interview me because they have a special study they're doing on prophecy and people's reaction to the end of the world. Everybody's focusing on this. And I, I do believe, friends, that the Lord is coming very soon. Amen. I'm not going to waste any time beating around the bush. I will tell you right now what I think is going to happen. I believe we're going to survive January 1, 2000. But you know what I worry about? The Bible says that when people say peace, peace, then sudden destruction comes upon them. I worry about the church because Jesus said when the Lord comes, all of the virgins were sleeping. Those ten, the wise and the foolish, all asleep when the Lord came. And Paul said that we should not be asleep as children of the night. We know the Lord's coming. We ought to be sober and awake. But the majority of the church is going to be asleep. And many will be unprepared because the world is going to be saying, peace, peace. And then the storm is going to come. And then the final events will wrap up in rapid succession. But I believe it's going to happen after January 1, as we enter into the new millennium. I'm not setting a date, but I think it's in the imminent future. One of our uh, people we interviewed on the street referred to the prophecies of Nostradamus. Have you actually ever read the prophecies of Nostradamus? There are hundreds and hundreds of uh, verses of gibberish. And it can be twisted. It's all nebulous, vague statements. Uh, one word here, one phrase there, a sentence here. And you can twist it to mean whatever you want it to say. And people say, oh, Nostradamus, a great prophet. Well, you know, if you just start muttering long enough, you're going to get something right. Most of these supermarket tabloid magazines that deal with prophecy are dealing with the future of the movie stars. Have you noticed that? As though God sends his prophets to tell the world what the movie stars are going to do. Jean Dixon fancied herself the psychic to the movie stars. Uh, she's passed away. She believes she was a true prophet because she claimed she had 75% accuracy. The weatherman has better than that. And, you know, she'd say things like, Elizabeth Taylor is going to get married again. Do you need to be a prophet to guess that? Right? Or some of these stars are going to go on a diet again or going to have problems. She also predicted that uh, Nixon was going to survive Watergate and he did not. And then she said Gerald Ford was going to run with a female running mate and he did not. And there's a lot of bizarre things, but people revered these folks as great prophets. Signs of the Times magazine did a study a few years back of 250 specific published predictions in these magazines. They found less than 3% could be listed as reasonably fulfilled. 97% or 244 missed the mark completely. Some of these self-proclaimed psychics basically shoot buckshot into the clouds hoping to get a stray duck every now and then. And they say, oh, I got one. I must be a prophet. Well, after you, you know, they say even a blind pig will find an acorn every now and then. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are psychics of God. And have you noticed there's a proliferation of these services on the internet and on television where you can call and you can get your personal psychic to guide you. It's becoming very in vogue. I think I told you opening night, a friend of mine called one of these numbers. The first thing they asked him for was his credit card. And uh, he said, well, you're a prophet. I'll know you're a prophet. If you can tell me my credit card, then I'll get your information. <laughs> Right up the street from where I live in Sacramento. They're all over town in the capital of California. I saw this one. I thought it was interesting because it, it almost looked biblical. Nice white building. It said spiritual readings. And you can't see this, but it says angel messenger. And inside it says angel readings. Well, that sounds kind of biblical. And as I was taking this picture, the proprietor came out and looked very suspicious and said, can I help you? I said, well, I'm taking a picture. What for? He said, you're the psychic. You tell me. So, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. We have another one up the street from us. Metaphysical bookstore. Psychic readings daily. And you'll be happy to know they take Visa and MasterCard. And they're part of the Better Business Bureau. You know, it's really amazing to me. Can you picture the prophets of God? Elijah goes to King Ahab. And he says, thus saith the Lord, the dogs will lick the blood of Jezebel by Naboth's vineyard. And here's my bill, $9.95, pay right now. <laughs> Is that how the prophets of God worked? Did they issue bills and, and uh, charge people for their prophecies? It, you ought to be suspicious right away. When a person starts charging a fee for a prophecy, whether they're really a prophet of God. Because a real prophet of God will not only give it for free, they will give the message of God if you kill them. 
if their life is on the line, like John the Baptist, they must speak truthfully. I've been praying through this seminar that God would give me the courage to tell the truth, even though I know I'm saying a lot of things that are not politically co correct, even in the churches. But I want to be faithful to God because he's the one I need to answer to. Amen. Question number two. Will there be both true and false prophets in the last days? Now, everyone knows there's false prophets. The Bible tells us in our answer, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Don't miss those words, many and few, as you find them in the Bible. They mean what they say. Christ says, broad is the gate and the road that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Many means the majority. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Incidentally, in the last days, those on the broad road to destruction are religious, just like those on the straight gate to life. Some people think that it's only those on the straight gate that are religious. Wrong. Hell is going to be full of religious people. It requires more than being religious to be in the kingdom, friends. These people were religious too. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will, when? The last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So we know there's going to be false prophets in the last days. Jesus said, beware, many false prophets will rise. As a matter of fact, if you read Matthew 24, where the disciples ask Jesus specifically about his second coming, the first thing he says in response is, take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying I am Christ, and deceive many. The first thing he says is, beware, there will be many false prophets that come in my name. They're not all claiming to be Jesus. They're coming in his name and deceiving people. And that's why we've got to know how to distinguish the true from the false because the majority are false according to Christ. But some people, because they're so apprehensive about the false prophets, are leery to believe there's any true ones out there anywhere. That is equally dangerous. God tells us that he will send his spirit and sons and daughters will prophesy in the last days. Now, why would Jesus warn us about the false prophets unless there was also going to be some true ones somewhere, right? Otherwise, Christ would say, don't listen to any prophets in the last days. He said, beware of the false ones. Prophecy is one of the gifts of the church that we need to the very end of time. I believe all the gifts are still available to the church. Amen? Notice also, I don't want to rush past this point, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. God also speaks through women. There are women prophets in the Bible. Let's see if we can name some of them. You've got Deborah, who appears in the book of Judges. You've got Miriam. You've got Huldah. You've got Anna, who blessed Jesus when he came into the temple. You've got the daughters of Philip, and there's several others. As a matter of fact, even Isaiah's wife was uh, considered a prophetess. Number three, what types of false prophets are specifically condemned in the Bible? Now we're going to go through a list. You can uh, make a mental note of this. They're not really answers that you need to respond to. A, one that uses divination, that would be a fortune teller, you divining, and most of these come from Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. Answer B, an observer of times, we would commonly call a what? An astrologer. God forbids that. Now, do not confuse astrology, which is this hocus-pocus nonsense that the stars millions of miles away are affecting the life of all these different humans here on earth. It is so preposterous. I told you my mother used to write horoscopes for some of these magazines. My mother wrote, um, she wrote a, a cassette tape of 12 Zodiac songs, a song for each one of the Zodiacs. And I remember asking mom, do you believe this stuff? She said, of course not. You think I'm stupid? And so the people who are writing these things and folks are measuring their day by what the lucky stars are saying in the newspaper and the folks who write it are laughing at them that they take it seriously. The moon, which is right near the earth, sort of affects our tides. Do you really think these stars that are hundreds and thousands of light years away are affecting your destiny day by day, whether you should shop or not today? <laughs> People believe this stuff. Now, astrology is forbidden. Astronomy is the legitimate study of the heavens, and I am fascinated with astronomy. I would like to be the first preacher in space. If you could just send somebody at NASA, show them my back handspring, I'm in good condition. I'm a pilot. I would love to be on the space shuttle. Wouldn't that be great? You know, they're talking about taking these different people, the old and the young. And what do you, take a preacher. I could represent everybody. I'm 
part Jewish, I'm a Protestant, went to Catholic schools, I could represent the whole world, right? <laughs> An enchanter, a magician. Now some say, well, Doug, you know, what about like a, a, a magician for a birthday party? It's not really talking about those who do the little tricks in it, and then they reveal that this is just a trick. Uh, but the magicians who are deceiving people into thinking they've got these powers, and that kind of deception is very dangerous. Harry Houdini uh, spent a lot of his time, even though he said everything he did was a trick, he did really try to search to find out if there was something beyond the, the tricks and the gizmos and the gadgets in the occult. See an enchanter, a magician, oh, I'm sorry, D, a witch, obviously. Some people say, well, they're good witches and they're bad witches. No, there's not. That's like saying Christian pornography. There's no such thing as good witches and bad witches. They're all, witches in the Bible are all forbidden. A charmer, someone who casts spells and incantations and, and that sort of thing. You know, there are a lot of people that get involved in a voodoo that are also claiming to be Christians. Are you aware of that? They cast spells and charms, and the Bible strictly forbids that. A consulter with familiar spirits, people who are trying to talk to the spirits in the spirit world. And connected with that also would be a wizard, a male psychic, uh, one who is sort of like a male witch, basically, is what that amounts to. Deuteronomy 18.11 forbids. A necromancer, a person who claims to consult with the dead. These things are strictly forbidden. And yet there are even Christians out there that think it's approved by God. They believe that the dead go right to, hev to heaven or hell. And that false doctrine that the dead go right to heaven or hell before the resurrection or before the judgment, that inspires them to think, well, why would God not want me to communicate with them? Just a little while back, one of these ridiculous magazines pasted Billy Graham's picture on the cover and then said, how to talk to your dead loved ones. He would never endorse that. And yet they're trying to make it look like, well, since we believe they're there, why wouldn't God want us to talk to them? But if you biblically know they're sleeping till the resurrection, then you know if someone from the dead is talking to you, who are you talking to? They are spirits of devils working miracles, Revelation tells us. And yet some people are trying to dial up their lost loved ones and get some feedback. <laughs> it's very dangerous. You know what worries me is there's so much of it in the leadership of the world among the elite kings and queens and presidents. You know, the people made a big deal about Hillary Clinton supposedly trying to consult with Eleanor Roosevelt, and she kind of laughed it off, but she does have friends that are psychics. Are you aware that uh, Princess Diana consulted her psychic the same week that she died, and the psychic gave her no indication that death was on the horizon? It wasn't very much help. You'd be surprised. The Bible says in Revelation 16, three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the beast and the dragon and the false prophet. And where do they go? They go to the kings of the earth, the leaders of the earth, to deceive them. There's more and more of this taking place where these people who are educated, that claim to be Christian, are dabbling with the occult and getting messages. Nancy Reagan freely admits that she consulted her husband's horoscope as she filled out his calendar. She just uh, last month admitted that uh, in a news statement. Oh, yeah. She says after he... Uh, there was an assassination attempt. She needed extra guidance so that these things wouldn't happen again. I remember growing up here in New York City, my mother and I and my brother, we had a Ouija board and we used to... And you know what? Weird things happen. I'll tell you, there are spirits and there is power and we used to get readings and messages and it felt like that little indicator was moving by itself around the board. And we were getting bizarre words that made sense. Tarot cards, that's called gambling with the devil. You ever had somebody say, I'm going to do your reading for you? Are people going to read your palm? Uh, this is all dabbling with the occult. People tossing chicken bones on the ground and cooking chicken gizzards to find out what the future tells. And you'd be surprised the wacky things that people do trying to tell the future. Is this how God reveals the future? No. Let's find out what the Bible says. First of all, number four, will God's end time church have the gift of prophecy? What does the Bible say? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon, say it with me, was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, you might say, okay, Doug, we've heard that several times. When you want to find out, we know what the commandments of God are, right? One of the characteristics of God's church in the last days is she will be keeping nine of the commandments. How many? 
all ten. You know there's a parable Jesus tells about a woman. What's a woman represent in prophecy? A woman that had ten pieces of silver, something inanimate but precious. What comes in the denominations of ten in the Bible that's precious? Commandments of God. She loses one. This is the Gospel of Luke. And she says, oh, well, I've got nine left. No. She lights a lamp. What's the lamp? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. She gets out the broom of works. She starts searching. And she searches and searches until she finds it. When she finds it, she says, what a bummer, another piece of silver. No. She rejoices and calls her friends together and says, I found that lost piece of silver. You know, God is telling in the last days that his church lost something precious. And when she finds it, she should rejoice. God's church will keep all of the commandments. Amen. Something else, though, it says she will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Revelation 19, verse 10, Gabriel told John in vision, he said, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is what? It's the spirit of prophecy. So one of the characteristics of God's church in the last days, she keeps the commandments and has the spirit of prophecy. All the gifts of the Spirit will be in the church, in including the Spirit of prophecy. Now, I want to pause for a minute, and I'm going to say some things that uh, may not be well received, but I think I need to say them. There are a lot of false prophets out there, and there's a lot of bamboozling and deception that's being done in the name of the Lord. And there are some ways that we need to know how to distinguish the genuine prophets from the false prophets. We have learned, first of all, one of the best criteria is you apply the Word and you look at the example of Jesus in the Word. You have to ask yourself, would Jesus ever say, okay, the Spirit is telling me there's someone out there and you've got pain in your lower back and the Lord wants to heal you right now. How many of you have seen this done before on, on TV or in a church service? Let me ask a question. Turn a camera around. I want to get an audience shot here. How many of you struggle with pain in your lower back? Let me see your hands. Hold your hands up. Well, I'm a prophet, what do you know? <laughs> or, I've been to churches before, the pastor will say, the Lord's just shown me, he's given me the word of knowledge. There's some of you here, and you struggle with headaches, and God wants to heal you right now. I don't want to embarrass you, but how many of you have reoccurring headache problems? Let me see your hands. Oh, it's just only 10% this time, rather than 30% with lower back pain. Or, I won't ask for a show of hands, I've seen pastors go, the Lord is telling me there's someone out there, and you're having family problems. And God is speaking to you. And he wants you to make an offering to our ministry. And he's going to bless you. He's going to heal those family problems. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm a pastor and I know that everybody with a family has problems. Amen? <laughs> and so, but people are so gullible, you know, they're, they're all absorbed with their back pain, their headache, their family problems. They're going, how did he know? And they don't realize that you're just like everybody else out there. Now, do you ever see Jesus anywhere in the Bible going, all right, there's somebody out there, you got leprosy, you're falling apart, and the Lord wants to heal you right now. You come forward. Is that how Jesus healed? All of these ridiculous antics, the showmanship, or the people come forward to receive the Holy Spirit and the pastor to hit them? To give them the Holy Spirit? Come on now. The Lord doesn't have to punch somebody to give them the Holy Spirit. Another pastor was breathing on folks and knocking them down, and you know, you'd see the whole, you'd see rows of chairs falling over. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. Where do you see Jesus saying, how about you out there? You want the Holy Spirit? Here it goes, one, two, three, wee! And they all <laughs> fall down. Now I know I'm, I, I'm being maybe a little bit sarcastic, but I just want to emphasize how outrageous this is that they're saying this is how God gives the Holy Spirit. This is how God communicates truth. This is how God heals people. They're making a mockery of the genuine gift of prophecy and the genuine gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit and how you can receive it in our next study. So don't miss that one. I remember a pastor. He was part of a church. And he freely admitted that they would trick people into thinking that there were healings. Sometimes he had a revival team that would go on the road and they would go from church to church. And he had people that would show up and they would pretend to be lame and they would pretend to be healed. And if you see somebody coming in in a wheelchair and they're acting good enough and you think they're part of the community, you know, there's some people that look like they could live anywhere, right? And you see them get up and walk, and they're rejoicing, and you think, wow, someone's been healed. And then they take an offering. Then they take an offering. Boy, I tell you what, these ministries rake in millions. You know why? 
because a lot of people are sick out there. And when people are sick, they're desperate. One of the most overpriced things in the world today is medicine and medical attention because people, when they're hurting, will pay and give almost anything. And people, when they know that they've got a disease and they're chronically sick or they're terminal, if a preacher extends a little bit of hope and the preachers capitalize on that desire, they will give, they will pray. And you know what? Let me add something. Some of these people do get temporarily better. Do not underestimate the power of faith. Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. Whenever someone was healed, the Lord said, your faith made you whole. So some people do often experience degrees of healing. I know this one pastor would tell people, he'd put them in sort of a state of mass hypnosis. And he'd say, you know, God wants you to throw away your glasses. And people would say, they'd take off their glasses, they'd say, I could see. And the power of the mind is so tremendous that for a few days they threw away their glasses, they'd stomp on them on the stage and... A few days later, they're out buying glasses again. <laughs> Many of these cases, the apparent healings are temporary because of the power of the mind over the body. It's underestimated. Some of them last. I'll admit it. Some people, I believe, experience healing because of their faith. I know people who've prayed. They've heard a message on TV, and it was, you know, a faith healer, faith preacher. They prayed to Jesus, and they asked for healing, and they were healed. And I believe the Lord healed them based on their faith, not based on the nincompoop who was on TV claiming to be representing Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us, let me back up and set this up a little better. A few years ago, a lot of evangelists got into trouble with immorality. There's two areas where evangelists typically get in trouble. It's with immorality and money. And a lot of them were falling, one after the other, some of them in both categories. And after some of these evangelists fell, people who had believed in them and their ministries were devastated. Now, let me just let you folks know, I don't want anybody following me. I'm a mess like everybody else. By God's grace, I've been faithful to my wife, and I pay my tithe, and I keep my hands out of the coffers. I'm just letting you know that. But she'll tell you I'm a mess, and I need your prayers. I don't want people following me. I want you to follow Jesus. But when these evangelists began to fall like dominoes, people said, I, I was blessed by their ministry. I came to the Lord, or I was healed by watching their program when they prayed. Don't forget that God can speak through a donkey if he wants to. Amen? <laughs> Have you read the story of Balaam? Yeah. The only reason I stand before you is because I know God can speak through a donkey. Amen? <laughs> and so, you, the Lord, might have spoken to you. That doesn't mean the person was flawless. God says that even the rocks will cry out if he wants them to. Amen? So don't put your stock in the vessel because God can use all kinds of instruments to do his will. And some of these people who are, they're not even converted themselves, God, when they speak the word, can utilize the word through them. The power is inherent in the word itself. But there's a lot of shenanigans. Oh, I was telling you about this friend of mine. One of the things he used to do is he, they always had this thing where people would have one leg that was shorter than the other that caused back pain. Have you heard of that before? And they'd come, I can sit down and I could stretch out one leg and make it look like, you just move your hips a little bit, and I can make it look like one leg is that much shorter than the other. And then they'd say, the pastor would pray and all of a sudden you'd see the legs go like this and they go, oh, it's a miracle. Oh, he's shifting his hips. And they, all these tricks and gimmicks that were designed to get people worked into a lather, showmanship, magician tricks, and then they take the big offerings. The prophets of God don't operate that way. The purpose for the prophets of God is to share the message from God. They're not forecasting the weather in the future. They're not guessing. I remember my brother calling me one time. He said, Doug, I don't pray much, but I want you to pray now. I said, what is it, Falcon? I'm ready to pray. He says, I want you to pray that the dolphins win the Super Bowl. <laughs> this is the way some people think that prophecy is to be advantageous so they can know how to invest. Next question, number five. No, the dolphins did not win. <laughs> in what day, in what ways does God speak to a true prophet? Numbers 12, verse 6 and verse 8. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a, a vision is one way, and I will speak to him in a, a dream. You know, the Lord spoke to uh, Isaiah in a vision in the temple of the Lord, and he spoke to Daniel in dreams. He spoke to Abraham and Moses mouth to mouth. He talked to Mary, and it says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as one that is wakened out of the sleep. So God spoke to many of the prophets through angels. 
mouth to mouth. Now, these prophets in the Bible vary in many ways. One of the great prophets, for instance, is not only John the Baptist, but Elijah, who was fed by the ravens. God provided for him. Uh, we don't really know where he came from. Just as Elijah the Tishbite, he appears on the scene of history, turns the world upside down, and goes to heaven in a fiery chariot. Never wrote a book. Then there are some prophets who wrote books like Gad and Nathan that were not included in the scripture because their prophecies were for specific people in specific times. They were not designed by God to be incorporated in the canon of scripture. Elijah, he had to match up his prophecies against four, oh, 850 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. They all said one thing, he said another, and one was true, 850 were false. How did we know Elijah was a prophet of God? He prayed, God answered. He said, let's prove. Let's do a test and see who's the real prophet. And finally, he took a special angelic escort to heaven. So we know he's a genuine prophet. But number six, are miracles definite evidence of a true prophet? No, matter of fact, we need to know that's not the safest way. It says, for they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world. And I believe Satan himself will seek to impersonate Jesus in the last days for the purpose of deceiving. You remember the story where Moses went in before the Pharaoh. He threw his rod down. It turned into a serpent. And the magicians came out and they threw their staffs down. They turned into serpents. I like the part where it says, but Moses' staff, his serpent ate their serpents. So they went home without their rods that day. Not only that, they were able to duplicate or counterfeit several of the plagues until finally the plague of lice came. And they said to the Pharaoh, this isn't a trick. This is the finger of God. We can't do lice. We've never practiced lice before. <laughs> so they were able to imitate or to create the illusion of a lot of these miracles. Do not base your faith upon supposed signs and wonders. I've told you, not only are there a lot of tricksters out there, that are scamming people, but beyond that, the devil can do really apparent miracles. And so if you think, now this could not have been a joke, this could not have been a trick, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was devils working miracles that magicians cannot perform. So don't base your faith on that. What do you believe? What the Bible says or what your eyes see? That leads us into our next question. What is the most important test of a prophet, a true prophet. Now we're going to look at what are the ways to determine a true from a false prophet. What does the Bible say? What's the most important test? We've looked at it again and again, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they're using 60% Bible and then they're mixing in other counterfeit information, there's no light in them. You know, all you need to do is put 1% strychnine and 99% Kool-Aid and you've got a lethal concoction. And that's the way that a lot of churches are being deceived. They've got elements of truth, but they've got some dangerous doctrines involved. And people say, oh, but there's so many good people. That's right, and he's calling them out into his truth before the end comes, amen? He says, they are my people. They're my sheep. They're going to hear my voice. There's going to be one fold and one shepherd when Jesus comes back, amen? He's calling his people together. You know, there's a lot of false prophets that have been used to bring about a lot of various religions. Back in the early 1800s, several denominations began to spring up like weeds all around the world in North America. And I don't want to be derogatory, but it's a fact that the Latter-day Saints will admit Joseph Smith, who is their recognized prophet, he claims that his information was superior to Scripture. I respectfully disagree with him. They say, well, the Bible translations cannot be trusted. Matter of fact, Joseph Smith did another Bible translation on his own. And he happened to incorporate a missing passage at the end of Genesis that prophesied his birth and his life. Very convenient. He added a whole passage in the end of Genesis that prophesied that he would come along. The Joseph Smith translation. Well, they got so much ribbing over that that most of the Latter-day Saints now do not incorporate that version. Uh, there are still some that uh, do recognize that. But any church that's telling you that the prophet's information is better than the Bible, you better not believe them. I think I told you, Jim Jones started out as a Methodist preacher, and Methodists are good people. He gradually migrated from that until he was jumping up and down on the Bible when he was in, uh, in Ukiah, California, up in uh, the, um, 
people's temple there. Then when he got to Jonestown, they were using the Bible pages as toilet paper. Started out with the Bible. Led all the people away from the Bible. He said, it's old. Old letter. I got fresh information. You know, when I present the Sabbath truth to some ministers, you know what I've heard them say? Doug, I realize the Bible says that, but the Bible's the old letter. I've got the Spirit now, and the Spirit is giving me fresh information that the first day is the new Sabbath day. My Spirit is telling me that. Well, the Spirit might be telling you that, brother, but it's not God's Spirit. Because the Spirit of God will never tell you anything contrary to or opposed to the Word of God. It must be according to the law and the prophets. Question number eight. What is the second test of a prophet? Answer. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, that does not mean that if a devil comes along and says, I believe Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that you need to believe him. I've heard some people use that scripture that way. It doesn't mean you just need to say that word like some kind of abracadabra and automatically you're credible. Because there's a lot of false religions that will say, I believe that Jesus came in the flesh. That's not the only criteria, but that is one of them is what the Bible is saying. You understand? They need to believe in the incarnation that God the Son came to earth in the form of a man as our sacrifice for our sins. That's one of the tests, but it's not the only one. Number nine, what is the third test of the prophet we have outlined here? Answer, it says, you'll know them by their fruits. Jesus said, many say to me, Lord, Lord, but they do not the things that I say. Look at their lives. A lot of these prophets, you look at their personal lives, they're in, they're in shambles, and yet they claim that they're prophets of the Lord. They're living in sin, and they're not following the Lord. You know, I think that... Uh, you need to really question sometimes the prophecies of those who are living immoral lives and contradicting the Bible when they claim that they're from God. Because they, the Bible says, holy men, and you could also understand holy women, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. God says he speaks through holy men and holy women, through the Holy Spirit. So if their lives are out of harmony, then you know that uh, it's not trustworthy. Number 10, what's the fourth test? Of a prophet. Answer, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass. Now, that's a very easy one. If the prophet prophesies as Noah that uh, there's a flood coming, then you know that uh, when the flood comes, hey, he was a prophet of God. Furthermore, Jesus was a prophet in his own right. It says, then that prophet shall be known that the Lord has truly sent him. Jeremiah 28, verse 9. Christ, for instance, foretold. That Jerusalem, he said, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. He said Jerusalem would be attacked. Not one stone would be left upon another in the temple. He made that prediction in about 30 A.D., 70 A.D., a generation in the Bible is 40 years. 70 A.D., 40 years later, Titus destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left upon another. We know Jesus was a prophet, don't we? So one of the ways you know also is, are there predictions 75% like the weatherman and Gene Dixon? Or are they 100% accurate? Number 11. What three things does Paul command regarding prophecy? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 and 21. Despise not prophesying. That means be willing to listen. Prove all things. Test it according to the tests that are given in the Bible. And finally, hold fast to that which is a good. You need to hang on to the true and you need to weed out that which is false. But keep your minds open. Are you aware there are some church denominations out there that tell their people that you're not allowed to look at information from any other organization? Are you aware of that? It's part of their creed. And some of them, when you're at the door, if they give you their literature, you say, well, thank you very much. I've got something to share with you. They'll say, thank you very much. But then they're commanded to take it and throw it away to get, get it out of circulation. They'll pretend they're going to read it, but they don't. And you need to, I like to always say, do you promise you'll read this? Uh, well, well, I'll look at it. They're really careful about how they say it. Now, friends, I'm happy to say that my church does not tell its people they're not allowed to look at information from any other church because I believe that the message of truth will stand up under investigation. <laughs> I remember one time I did a meeting like this in a town and a Presbyterian minister was very upset with me because some of his people were coming and accepting the truth. He said, Pastor Doug, you're stealing our sheep. <laughs> I said, Brother so-and-so, they're not my sheep. They're not your sheep. They're his sheep. And furthermore, the sheep go where the grass is. Amen? Amen. 
And he said, well, what do you think? Maybe I should go give some Bible studies to some of your members. I said, help yourself. Now, this is the truth. A few weeks later, I saw him again. I said, I heard you're studying with sister so-and-so. He said, yeah. I said, but your people know their Bibles too well. <laughs> That's what he said. And so, I'm not afraid. I think if you're rooted in the truth, you will know how to give an answer. The Bible tells us, Peter says, that God's people ought to be prepared to give an answer to any man that asks the reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Amen? We ought to know how to defend our faith. That's how I became an evangelist. One by one, I started sharing my faith. People would ask me questions. I'd have to go look for the answers. And by the grace of God, I started learning. And if you are not afraid to stand up, I believe that the Word of God can bear up under investigation. I'm not afraid to be challenged. We've done everything we can during this seminar to invite people to ask questions, even the difficult ones. Amen? Amen. We've been willing to deal with them. Now, oh, one more thing I want you to notice here. Typically, it's been the pattern, the Bible says, these are the words of Jesus, for us to accept the false prophets, because there's so many of them, and reject the true. Christ, before he died, he prayed over Jerusalem and he wept. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent unto thee. True prophets are typically not popular. Is that clear to you biblically? True prophets are very rarely popular. Now, I'm going to tell you that I believe that God's remnant church not only has the law and the prophets, but we have a modern manifestation of a prophet that came to God's people to raise up the remnant church. How many of you have heard of Ellen White? Let me see your hands. When I was living up in the cave and I accepted the Lord, I began to visit different churches. And they all disagreed with each other. And I finally went to a friend who knew I was going, I was going to church on Sunday. One church said, unless you're part of this church, you're not going to be saved. Unless you're part of this church, you're not going to be saved. Their doctrines were all conflicting. I went back to the cave and I prayed. I said, Lord, there's so many churches. There's one Bible, one Jesus. I want you to show me the truth. And after I prayed that prayer, somebody came by my cave 3,500 feet up in these desert mountains and gave me a book called The Great Controversy, written by this woman, Ellen White, about 1880. And as I read through that book, I thought, I don't know who wrote this. Never heard of Seventh-day Adventist. Never been to a Seventh-day Adventist church. But I was reading that book by myself in the mountains, and I said, this is inspired. Yeah. It was filled with Scripture. And all of a sudden, all these Bible mysteries began to unfold for me. And most of what I've been sharing with you in this seminar has been confirmed in me through reading things that Ellen White wrote. Now, here's the question. Have I been preaching from Ellen White's writings or from the Bible? Bible. Ellen White was a girl who, her name was Ellen Gould Harmon. She later married a young minister named James White, who when she was a young lady, very feeble health, doctors thought she was going to die when she was about 17, she received a vision from the Lord after the great disappointment when the Lord did not come. And it was a vision of God's people. And he said, I'm calling you to be a messenger for me. And she did not want to do it. She tried to shrink away from the responsibility. But the Lord said it was a lethal thing to do to turn away from a, a calling of God. And she said, Lord, give me strength. And she, from that time, from the age of 17 to 87, worked as a messenger of the Lord and was instrumental in raising up the fastest growing Protestant movement in the world today that's based on the Bible, with nothing more than a third grade education. She wrote more books than any other woman in history. I think that's significant. Matter of fact, the only person in North America who wrote more was Benjamin Franklin. She wrote on virtually every subject. At one time while she was in vision, she had supernatural strength. You know, the Bible says that God strengthened those while they were in vision. Remember, Daniel was faint and God touched him and he was strengthened. She held up a 20 pound Bible for about half an hour, and she read without even looking at it, pointing to it. She wouldn't breathe. Doctors would examine her while she was in vision. They'd hold a mirror up to her, sometimes for half an hour. No breath would fog the mirror. And she would make these flowing motions as she was in vision. Sometimes five minutes in vision, she would get a week's worth of material. Writing up to 20 pages a day, she wrote, now let me read just a few facts to you here about Ellen White. Um, right now there are 128 titles that bear her name. In eight of her leading books, she develops the subject matter using over 14,000 Bible texts. So if you think that she's speaking on her own or using scripture, there are 32,000 texts in the Bible. In only eight of her she uses 14,000 Bible references. 
You know, one of the things that Ellen White says all the time is, do not use me. She says, I am sent to direct you back to the Bible. I have no light of my own as, except as I am the moon reflecting the light of the sun. She never called herself a prophet. Of course, John the Baptist didn't call himself a prophet. Um, let me read some quotes to you here. Paul Harvey, I had the privilege of meeting him a few years ago. How many of you have heard the Paul Harvey radio broadcast? Women have been honored on an American postage stamp for more than 100 years, starting with one woman who is not even an American, Queen Isabella, in 1893. Since then, 86 women have been honored, ranging from Martha Washington to Marilyn Monroe. Also, many women authors like Louisa May Alcott, Emily Dickinson, Willie Catherine, Rachel Carson. But I can name an American author who has never been honored thus, through her writing, though her writings have been translated into 148 languages. For more than Marx or Tolstoy, Tolstoy more than Agatha Christie, more than William Shakespeare, only now is the world coming to appreciate her recommended prescription for optimum spiritual and physical health. Ellen White, Ellen White, you don't know her? Get to know her, quoting Paul Harvey. How many of you have heard of Dr. James Dobson? One of my church members sent him some of her books she wrote on child guidance. This is his response. Dear Mrs. Kunke, thank you very much for your letter of May 12th. Please accept my apology for the delayed response. I receive 300 to 900 letters each day, which makes it virtually impossible to an answer them all promptly. I greatly appreciate your sharing Ellen White's material with me. I have all of her books. They are excellent, underlined. If she were alive today, she and I would no doubt share a kindred spirit. May God bless you in a special way. Signed, James C. Dobson, Ph.D. When she died, one of the fruits of a true prophet is that they live a godly life. New York newspaper called The Independent, right here in New York City, said, speaking of her, these teachings of Ellen White are based on the strictest doctrine of inspiration of Scripture. Seventh-day Adventism could not have gotten out in any other, could not have gotten in any other way. And the gift of prophecy, through Ellen White he's speaking of, was to be expected as promised to the remnant church who held fast to the truth. This is not a member of our church writing this eulogy. This faith gave great purity and life in incessant zeal. No body of Christians excels them in moral character and in religious earnestness. Here it says, um, her writings cover nearly every subject, including spiritualism, hypnotism, agriculture. She talks about the San Francisco fire and earthquake, Martin Luther, the Civil War, prize fights, slavery, heaven, the new earth, ministry of angels, disease, health, you name it, rearing children, third grade education. A tremendous blessing. And I think that you ought to evaluate what you find in the Bible. Prove all things. Some of you say, well, I've never heard of her before. You need to get acquainted. Try the spirits and hold fast to that which is good. Through the inspiration, God used her and this body of believers from many different churches. The Seventh-day Adventist movement was born, and it spread to much of the world today. Matter of fact, among many of the different churches in the world today, we now enjoy one of the, I think it's probably the greatest um, medical work of any Protestant church. It's the most extensive educational work of any Protestant church the world over. Look at the four tests that you find in the back of the lesson, in the supplement, and you will discover that there's a great deal there that helps you see she met and filled every one of those qualifications for a true prophet. Whenever God does something extraordinary, he raises somebody up. Before the flood, who did he call? Noah. Before the exodus, he had Jeremiah and Isaiah. Before Jesus came, John the Baptist. Doesn't it stand to reason to you that before the great climax of the controversy that he's going to have messengers he'll speak through? In the past, he's spoken through holy men and women. He speaks through them still today. All the gifts of the Spirit are available today. Question number 12. Whose counsel do we reject whenever we reject the words of a true prophet? Luke 7, verse 28 to 30. There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And all the people heard him, and the publicans justified God. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. Friends, it's a very dangerous thing for us to not take advantage of the gift that God has given us when he speaks to us through these prophets. Take a look at the last question there, your response. Since God still speaks through prophets, 
And since a true prophet's words are the personal testimony of Jesus to you, are you willing to test, that's all I'm asking, friends, are you willing to test modern prophets by the Bible and follow the counsel of those who agree with Scripture? Is that your desire, friends? I have learned so much from the ministry of Ellen White and her writings, and the reason is it all is biblical. What I've been presenting in the seminar is from the Bible. And I'd like to pray with you and for you that you will test and prove and hold fast to that which is good. Does that sound fair, friends? Apply the Bible test. Father in heaven, be with each of these people. Give them the grace and discernment and wisdom that comes from your spirit. Help them to know that there's a blessing in those who hear what the spirit says to the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't forget that our next presentation will be when? Friday night. We're going to talk about how to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that one. God bless you. We'll see you then.